So you're all supposed to meet today because college is actually sick, so I'm going to be the person asking questions and poking around. But um, obviously we're all here for human-centered design, and that's all about putting people at the heart of everything that we do. Um, and today, I'm going to see Yeah, it's uh, So today's kind of topic is how can we actually make truly inclusive uh, products and services. So. We're going to run this pretty much like we did the last one, but keep it really kind of informal. This is all about having a huge discussion and chat, so we can all kind of help each other out because we've got a great panel of experts in this field that are going to talk to us about kind of their experiences. But also feel free to just like raise your hand, ask any questions, um, and I'll, the guy's going to be here to answer. Um, obviously, uh, here at Code, we think inclusive design is super duper important and. We've actually been partnering with uh, Manchester Deaf Centre recently, which is why I really care about this stuff. Um, and Toby's made some beautiful kind of posters over there, calling you out. Um, but yeah, today is just all of us having a bit of a chat, a bit of a discussion, maybe even a bit of a debate on how we're going about making inclusive digital uh, products and services. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Alex, I'm a front-end software engineer at Cinch. Uh, I've been at Cinch now for around 18 months uh, and yeah, I've got a huge passion for that, so I'm really looking forward to answering any questions that you may have. Okay, I've got to make this short. <laughs> um, so, um, my name's Gareth Ford Williams, uh, currently director at uh, Avery, which is an inclusive design data company. Uh, I also work as a consultant for various companies like, uh, well my name at the moment is Diageo, uh, around inclusive design, but for 18 years uh, around accessibility, digital accessibility, BBC, founded design research team there as well and was also uh, head of UX design for 12 years. That's a bit intimidating. I'm Sam Hurst, I'm a uh, user researcher in um, the Department for Education, um, so I'm now, government has to make sure that things are accessible for, for all its users, so I've had quite a lot of experience, I've worked on there. Uh, I worked for the Department for Working Pensions for, um, you know, for my sins, um, worked on a disability benefit there uh, for a couple of years, so you know, every user I did research with had a disability, as soon as I showed them so I learned a huge amount there and been an advocate ever since. Um, hi, I'm Rosa. I'm a Digital Inclusion and Engagement Officer for, for Citizens and Vice Manchester. Um, so I work with the most digitally excluded population of Manchester in my role as a mix of service design and user research. And I'm also a neurodiverse activist. <laughs> hi, I'm Leila. Um, I'm a front end engineer and here at Code. Um, I've been here for about six months. A uh, huge passion for accessibility too. Uh, in my previous job, I uh, worked a lot with um, NHS clients, so I've got experience with having to build accessible websites. What prevents us from making um, inclusive uh, products and services accessible? Um, I think we just covered a bit before in the last talk. But I think representation is so important. Like. If there is no lived experience in, in companies, there is no way that the products you're creating and the services are truly inclusive, no matter how much user research there has been, has been done. Um, and I think sometimes the business, the business side of it is always a, an obstacle, isn't it? Because there is obviously a business advantage to being accessible and inclusive, but there's also blockers and it makes things are, are complicated in a way, but and I think that's one of the main obstacles to truly inclusive and accessible services. But it's also people get a bit overwhelmed by how do we do this, what do we have to do, what are all the options, and that bit of insecurity can lead us to kind of not feel a bit fearful about trying new things and about doing things a bit differently. Um, yeah, I think for me, one of the things is also the lack of education uh, around accessibility. Uh, coming from an engineering point of view, um, there's a lot of engineers that, that I've seen in my experience who 
um, and it quite shocks me actually that they have either never heard of or don't really know what semantic HTML means. So to kind of give a bit of context as to what it is for those that don't know what they're in the room, is is a way of um, giving context and, and extra information as to, uh, around uh, what certain elements uh, mean on a page. So for example, if you take a navigation, there's a navigation element. Um, the fact that yeah, that not many engineers that that have come across are aware of this um, surprises me quite a lot. And I think that's down to essentially where they've been taught. Um, I like there's been a lot of this, and also I think it's also how like the engineering world has kind of moved on. Um, I think we're at a place now where engineering is kind of almost very JavaScript heavy. There's a lot of um, boot camps out there where where they essentially only teach you JavaScript frameworks and what that essentially means is that for any engineer who's up and coming and is learning all these frameworks, they lose all knowledge of raw semantic HTML is because they're not being taught the basics of HTML, CSS and JavaScript. So, um, and um, yeah, I think that there's, that's one of the challenges I think is to be trying to shift that focus from, um, from all these JavaScript frameworks and, go, and trying to go back to the basics. So yeah, I think a lack of, a, a lack of education is definitely one of those, those reasons. Quote, Ian Mountain, uh, who's an ex-member of BBC Accessibility Team, and he was said that um, HTML is screen reader UX, yeah. And, yeah. which is one of the things that regularly gets forgotten. Um, we did a talk years and years ago at the BBC called Moral Code, which was all about the morality of the impact of the choices of the code frameworks that you use. Anything that's front end immediately impacts on the UX and you have to understand the impact as you're making the choices. It's not something that happens later on when you fix. But I think going back to I think why it it isn't you know often I wouldn't say it isn't often considered, but it isn't often understood, it is for various different reasons and, and they, they can come a lot through process. So one of the things that we're often quite frightened of doing within any project is only exclusion up front. Jamie mentioned in that quote, expanding on something that we always used to say within the UX team, is that you know when something is just a concept, when we have a brief, everyone has equal access to that brief. There are no barriers to a brief, it's just a concept. But every single time we make a decision, both UX and technical, we are at a point where we're starting to filter people out through our decisions. So inaccessibility is proactive. It's not accessibility is a thing that tries to fix the bad decisions that we've made as designers and developers. And so what we have to do is go, you know, shift it left, go upstream, and understand the impact of the decisions that we make. And we used to run a little workshop called Who Are We Willing to Exclude? And we'd actually, at the beginning of it, write a list and, and these are not people who we're necessarily going to actively exclude, but if they can't use the service that we're building, it's not something that we're going to lose sleep over. So if it was a news application, we put up the under fives, we'd go under there. Because there aren't many core news addict, you know, sort of users who are five years old or under. And so we're not designing for them. And we would add, you know, we would understand at the BBC there are four from a cultural point of view within the within the, um, uh, uh, the Royal Charter, there are four native British languages, which is English, Welsh, Gaelic, and British Sign Language. Their cultural access around that is very, very important. So you have to consider those within the way that you're specifying the, you know, your approach to the product. But Polish, at the, well, a few years ago, last time I looked was about four years ago, the language so the levels around it, but Polish at that time was the second most spoken language in the UK, but it wasn't in the Royal Charter, so we would say we were willing to exclude, we're not, we don't have the permission to build a Polish, Polish language service, so we were willing to exclude, exclude anyone who spoke Polish but not a native British language, and so you do this, but then you do the second list called designed experiences, and everyone else gets a designed experience, and we list them. And this is where you bring in all of those other groups, and then if anyone says, oh, yeah, well, we're going to try and fix that at the end, then we stick them on the willing to exclude list, and we put your name against it. And it's a really tough process to go through, but accessibility is, is only there when design fails, and, and it's there to try and fix. Inclusive design and universal design are where accessibility should always sit. Um, I, I'm going to learn from one quote. 
on, on, this, on this point was Dieter Rams. If any of you are familiar with Dieter Rams, he said a brilliant quote around this back in the 1970s. He said the one and only cardinal sin in design is not designing for the reality in which we live. And barriers and preferences and needs of people are their realities, whether they are functional or emotional. And if you don't design for those, then any accessibility happens. <laughs> and another thing. <laughs> so, I'll try to make sure because I'm <laughs> um, I, I think from, from my experience, nobody intentionally excludes uh, people with access needs. I think it's just complete lack of awareness. Um, but we've been saying that for, you know, I think I first touched on accessibility probably about 12 years ago. And we're still saying, all oh, education needs to improve. So you can't, you can go yeah. like a coding boot camp, do it in five days. And I've asked coders who we've recruited recently as juniors to cover accessibility. And they're like, what, what is accessibility? So I think there's that. I think if you're not doing user research and inclusive, you are then designing for the people you speak to or yourselves. So if you don't have to say what goes on your team, you, you're bugged. Um, and it is, you know, it's quite intimidating to, you know, Instead of doing research with uh, disabled people, some people are terrified of doing it, which is always interesting. Um, and then just, you know, uh, GDS have this mantra that accessibility is everyone's responsibility. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that, that I found, is that if, if it's everyone's responsibility, nobody takes a lead on it, so then it becomes no one's responsibility. So pretty much every discipline in an agile team, which is how we work in government, has a role to play in accessibility, but most people aren't aware of what that is. They'll have a guess and they'll try and do the best, but they're not quite sure what it is and how to do it. They're a bit embarrassed to ask. And other people have just never thought of it. And it, it's you know, just constantly making people aware of it. But again, we've been doing that 12 years ago, um, and you know, for a lot longer than I have. And I'm, I'm in no way an expert in their accessibility. Um, but those are some of the things that I've seen. Or, I have seen some deliberate experience, and I worked at a place that uh, did Wilkes. Uh, so, you, you know, compared to regular people, tend to do that because they're getting, you know, 50s, 60s, it starts to uh, become a thing that people think of. You can only do it over the phone. Um, we were encouraging the legal team to say, do you not want to consider maybe making another way that people can do this? Because you're excluding a ton of people who are going to buy it. So, from a business perspective, it's a poor, poor decision. And the response of the head lawyer was, great bands don't make sunglasses for people with one ear. So it was like a deliberate Jesus. choice to just <laughs> not like How many people, around 50 plus, start to hear yeah, them start to yeah. hear <coughs> And you're going to start thinking about the world because you've got, you've got money, you've got potential yeah. paid off much of your mortgage, you've got kids, you've got potential got grandkids. It, it's madness. So you do get some people who uh, are deliberate. Um, unpleasant, I guess. Yeah. yeah, I was happy that you finished that, that way because that's what I was going to say. I don't think people, I think people do set out to make decisions that just disadvantage disabled people the most. I think there are decisions that are made for business and you understand why, you understand why they designed it that way or why they made it this way, but for example, if something is a bit hidden or if something that you have to opt out of or, you know, and if you're, in particular, if you're like neurodiverse, you're much less likely to notice that, especially when that change happened like overnight and now, like, you know, I'm thinking in particular of Amazon when it was, now you have to actually change the way you get things delivered or you pay that extra. That kind of a surprise at first and I had, and if you're not very familiar or actually you're not, even if you're just someone that might not even be disabled, but is a first time user of the internet or doesn't use it that often, you're much more likely to get caught in these little tricks, design traps, I guess. I'm going to, I'll go on. Just to add to that as well, I think there's also, um, there's, there's an issue with the assumption that people on the back of um, the example used about Amazon um, and things as a surprise. 
I only come in and speak on behalf of the clients we support at Manchester Tech Centre, but there is a presumption there around um, language acquisition and the understanding of language as well. Um, a really common misconception for deaf people is that they can understand written English. Um, so when it comes to design and things, um, Again, it's just a complete lack of awareness. It's a lack of um, maybe representation. Um, if you haven't got somebody there on the team who can kind of put their hand up and say, oh, you've got all this, then it does just kind of go by the wayside kind of thing. Um, so just a thought around language barriers as well. So how do you cope with the breadth of different accessibility needs? Because it's almost feels like uh, Jack of all trades, master of none, kind of thing, maybe? You know, is it too broad for a single team to look at? I mean, I don't know. Does anyone have any good I've just answered your own question. <laughs> <laughs> your own no, 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 because you used the word needs. Yeah. And all of this was, I mean, no matter what demographic, and we think of this in very, do you know the difference between medical and social model of disability? Right, this is, this is where you need to start. So, the medical model of disability is around, I've got ADHD, I'm dyslexic, which, you know, and I'm, I'm massively uh, sort of obsessed with that fidget toy at the minute and hugely jealous of it, wishing I brought one. Um, <laughs> and that's, my focus is on that, it's brilliant. But, but the thing is, that doesn't tell you anything about the barriers that I face when accessing stuff. You will jump to conclusions within this because we think in very general terms. Because WIPAC, was based around uh, a need in the American legal system from the American government. And so it's all based on a very medical model which the American legal system is based on. It's not, you know, it's designed by law. And okay, it's full of very sensible things and use it as a tool and a resource, it's great. It isn't an answer to everything. Um, it's a place to start. You know, I don't go to lawyers for design advice in the same way as I don't come to designers for legal advice. Generally, you know, I'm not dissing all of the designers in the room, there may be some legal experts in here, but I, I wouldn't be confident in that. And that's, you should be the same around that. But people's needs are the thing is where you need to start. And these can be needs around modality, around culture. They can be needs around, you know, sort of cognitive model around stuff. And this is design when it gets down to it. It all starts in design and asking good questions. Not thinking about what the solutions are necessarily up front, but understanding what the questions are that we should be asking up front and understanding the barriers and the needs that, if they're not met, create barriers. That's the process around this. And so we find that needs are intersectional. So, for instance, I have a need, being dyslexic, for very human centric, quite straightforward language that's very direct in the way things are written. It's my need, but I find that that is the same need for someone with English as a second language. It's the same need with someone who's got an age-related cognitive function disability. It's got the same need for someone from a socioeconomic background, maybe that didn't access education and does not have a higher reading level as other people. There are a whole load, so probably about a third of the population have that need. And it's not a disability thing, it's a need. And if that need is not met, the barrier is created. That is the way you need to switch your thinking around. Or at least that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would agree. I, I have ADHD as well. Um, so, hey. Two days. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the kind of things that you know, people would not think about as someone with ADHD is that. I'm likely to forget things, so uh, things like bills, um, you know, warnings about, you know, oh, you, you drove over um, the bridge, and um, I told on it, you're supposed to you know, download an app and pay it, and I'm always like, I don't want to do that because I've been fined twice. And then I forget, and then the bill arrives, and I think, oh, let me out. Um, and there's no, you, know, there's, you could just design that payment account quite easily with, with almost minimum effort. But if you think, uh, just about you know, based it on needs and not about disability as well. So if you think about um, if you can only do something over the phone, you're excluding people with anxiety disorders, you're excluding people who are just bloody impatient, but you mean you're excluding people with uh, a deaf or hard of hearing or, or who have a speech impairment, 
And you also explain about the temporary uh, people who are uh, dis disabled by their situation or temporarily. So, you know, you've got laryngitis and can't speak. Or you're in a very, you, you work in a, uh, a busy area, which you've got an urgent phone call to make, or you've got an urgent service that you need to access, but you can't hear because you, you work on a building site. Or, you know, there's so many things, and Microsoft have quite a good poster that talks around situational disability, temporary disability, and, and permanent disability. And you look at, I mean, how many people here use subtitles? Uh, and I imagine probably almost everyone switches subtitles on um, because, you know, Film, the film audio balance quite often is not particularly great, you want to hear what the conversation is. It, it wasn't designed for that, it was designed to help people who, who couldn't hear the soundtrack, but actually we all benefit from that. Uh, and the argument, I mean, the number of arguments we in government we have about dumbing down language and, you know, the thing that was on uh, like NHS website about using the word poo or something like that, or something like, rather than say genitals, using like, I, I can't even, something, something <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, uh, there's something. It was, I think it's ball sack. It's used. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, well, everyone knows what that is, but it's being used in testicles. Not everyone knows what that is. So, it, I mean, and you know, this argument about dumbing down language and you know, not everyone has a reading age. Right? The, the sun is written to a reading age about seven or eight. And, yeah. and reading ages are not a particularly brilliant thing to use, but it sets it. It's a good layman's term to make them think, oh god, yeah. But the argument of, you know, a doctor doesn't want to read stuff into the language. Of course he does, because, or she does, or they do. Because they're reading tons and tons and tons of stuff every day. They don't want it to be seen as complicated. They want to find the information they need quickly and easy. So it's a nonsense to argue about language being dumbed down as well. I mean, you know, if there's any content design in the audience, yeah. Content design is the single biggest challenge in government because our, you know, the, the language you use is horrendous. Um, I, I would, you know, if I could pick one um, user sentence design discipline to have on the team, it would be a content design mm -hmm. because that's probably like 99 just like my problem to go out and say. Yeah, I think uh, besides the point that obviously like language needs to be simpler and like it's more than time that content design doesn't come as the last point in wireframe and prototyping, it's not just an empty piece that you can that you can feel after. But also, yeah, it's the fact that so it's I think it's when the in the last census, so this might change for the next one, but it was one in six adults in England do not have a very poor literacy level. That's one in six. And also it's like when you think about people who do have English as a second language, a lot of those people, especially the most vulnerable one, <clears throat> might not be able to read in English, but they might not also be able to read in their mother tongue. So it's it's not enough to translate something and to have that option. And I think at the end of the day, there's a lot that's being done for accessibility, for inclusion, but people don't know about it. People don't know where to find it in websites. They don't know to click that widget. And What's the point of having an accessibility statement in a website that no one cares about? Yeah. Like no one's gonna go there and read that and no one's gonna know like, oh, I cannot ask you for a, pro a copy of what you have in there, like a, um, a simple read copy of that. It's, it's just not fit for purpose. There's a lot more that needs to be done directly with people to support them, to make them aware of what is available to them. Because if we think that to, it's like about 20% of the UK's population is disabled, however, uh, that it's with, for internet non-users, 50 over 50% of them are disabled. So there's so many benefits to using the internet to do all this stuff but they're not actually translating to improving people's, with the majority of people's life. It's just, life is just too complicated at the moment. We need to simplify, we need to go back. You have to say You're going to get older as well. And 50% of people, 65 plus, have, uh, would be, would be classed as disabled, but the problem you know, might not identify it's just I'm getting older, but we're all heading that way. We, you know, we're all going to live longer, we're all going to be asked to work longer. So you design your potential crap tools for yourself in, that you're going to need in, if, if it's a mid 
about 20, 20 years now. I don't think I explained what the social model of disability was. Even I, <laughs> I just found myself going off on a massive tangent about the medical model. So, by the way, the social model of disability says that nobody has a disability. They have impairments and differences, and they are disabled by the environment. When the, the environment is not designed to meet their needs, that disables them. And that can be a digital environment, it can be content, it can be all sorts of different things, it can be customer experiences. And so they're disabled by the world around them, they're not a disabled person. Although you do then have cultural disability and, you know, and deaf culture is a very, very important part. This is, you know, you've got to think about this. This is not just about functional accessibility, this is about culture and emotional accessibility. I've been talking to the W3C for ages about this one thing that I've always felt was missing in their principles because they talk about perceivable, operable, operable understandable and robust. They were written in the 1990s because they were, they, were, they were designing this stuff for American government websites and banks and stuff and I said well where's the emotion in this? Where's enjoyable? Because we now have social media networks, we now have video streaming services, online games, we have collaborative platforms. We have things where people go and they enjoy their experiences there. So if you make it completely functional and they still don't enjoy it, they're never coming back. You've still got to make it enjoyable within the context of those needs. But yeah, just getting back to the social model. The social model is, it's the designers disabled people, not the person is disabled themselves. How do you almost make it so that somebody can't say, well, you've only got one year, so I'm not going to make the sunglasses for you, but actually there's so many people who are going to be disadvantaged by this, um, that it isn't just that small population that you're looking at, actually it impacts so, so many others, so I'm just wondering if anybody's actually approached it in that way and like combined it, it as a need, regardless of the impairment. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking of so many different examples of this. I mean, I'm going back to the 2012 Olympics, and so this was, oh, two, we were started thinking about designing for this in probably about 2010, so we were just getting into mobile applications and starting to look into building native web apps at the time. There were no accessibility guidelines for mobile, and the BBC wrote the first ones. Um, and, but it was because we had to do the work, because we needed to make the Olympics accessible, and they were in two years' time, and no one was going to, no one was going to set that date back. You know, we had a transmission date, and we need to deal with this now. And so we started thinking about needs around this. And one of them, there were many, but one of them that came about was colour contrast. Yeah. And we started looking at the behaviour of people with mobile phones. And what is the one thing that we all do to sustain the life of our battery? Is we turn the brightness of our screens down therefore visually impairing ourselves in context of the interface. So if we're not making it as high contrast as possible in the application, they can't turn the brightness down far enough, which means their battery runs out. And these people are going to be out at events, you know, which is when the sports applications get used most, is when people are at matches, games, events, etc. And the same with Glastonbury apps and all sorts of bits and pieces. And so this is core user behavior. And this is accessibility as need to the entirety. You know, and you can look at there's tons of data out there. You know, just look at the data coming out of Facebook and Twitter, etc., about captions and people viewing stuff with the sound switched off. It's over 80% of all of the content is with the sound off. Yeah. Which means it must be captioned whether it's open or closed. Doesn't matter, it's still accessible in that context. You know, so these needs are core, and you can find those contacts. There's tons of them, and I won't go on. <laughs> but yeah, does anyone else have a good one? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's just, like I was saying before, it's about simplifying. Like, I'm all about creativity and innovation, but I think sometimes we don't need to keep creating stuff. We just need to make what we have good and better and work. So it's like, if we're working somewhere and we implement, I don't know, a new project there, we do something with the staff, okay, and then it gets to the end and then we go away, the staff really understand the new software that they're using. Are they using it to their advantage? Or is it just causing more problems at the end than it was before? Because I think a lot of times we, we think, I think people 
So they have to understand as, as someone who has autism, so people rarely like speak their mind and say what they mean. So sometimes people can say, oh, I've understood that, or I'm doing that right, and they're actually not doing. So when you look at data collected for like EDI or any data we collect, like you really don't need to be collecting data analyticals in our website like all the time. I think it's just a bit of a waste, really, especially like in terms of sustainability and like what are we gonna do with all of this, but what was I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, if, what we were using the data that we collect, and like, you know when sometimes people like to say prefer not to don't know or prefer not to say, how much of that data is true, or was it that a staff member didn't feel comfortable asking those questions, offering those reasonable adjustments, you know? So actually, I think we have a duty to just make everything that we create as simple as possible for everyone's benefit. Uh, yeah. I think um, I would try and figure out. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, sorry, I was going to ask a question. Oh, no. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember who answers who asks the question. That's so my idea. Just keep it. In. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, Whoever it was, I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, I think it's figuring out what lever you can pull to make the person care. Ideally, it's because they're not scumbag and don't want to exclude people, but unfortunately, you know, that doesn't always work. So, with government, uh, we, so the regulations came out in 2018 called the Public Sector Body Accessibility Regulations, that mean anything that is offered by the public sector has to be accessible. And they really got around anyone going, oh, we've only got 400 users, or, oh, it's an intranet, so it doesn't really count, um, because it's anything you can access by a browser, which really pigeonholes people, which is brilliant. So we have we have a massive stick that well, you get sued, don't they? So, yeah, if you want to take the risk and sign that off and go live, go for it. Um, or you've got the carrot, which is actually, you know, you, you, don't, want to, you don't want to make um, a will service very long online. Well, actually, Let's look at the data. You are missing out on 20% of uh, user base, which equates to X amount of money. So it's figuring out what what is going to make the person care. And you know, as a user researcher, playing video back or getting people like that out to meet users who are struggling with stuff is phenomenal. So I, I went to Manchester Deaf Centre about what, about eight years ago now as a researcher, and it was really intimidating because I was sort of stuck in the middle of a circle and everyone was signing around me and I had no clue what was going on. I worked for the Department for Work and Pensions who everybody bloody hated at the time because the, you know, it's full of papers that everyone's a, everyone on a disability benefit was a scrap again. So it was during that time and people were very angrily signing and I was in the middle of that and no idea what was going on and it, it was really quiet in the intimidating atmosphere, and I was like, this is probably what it's like being deaf around a lot of people who are speaking. Um, so I think exposing people to people who, who, you know, some of them will probably have to say their relatives, but many people like that have never been near a disabled person in their life, don't have to close them, wouldn't even know a disabled person if you can't just judge by looking at someone. Um, so I think that's a good one. I, I think the famous example there was, uh, a government service quite a few years ago um, where the, the whole organisation was a standard that somebody who was blind could use a computer. And, and when somebody told them, like, just, just call and understand how that could be the case. Um, so, yeah, one of the interesting stuff. I've just realised one I should mention. I mentioned right at the beginning when I was talking about myself that I work with Diageo. Now, looking at the bottles that are in this room, they make a disabling product. Um, you know, they make Smirnoff and Guinness and, and Baileys and, and about 250 different alcohol brands. And so one of the things that we're looking at is cognitive accessibility in the context of the use of their digital products in situations like bars and events where people are gradually becoming more disabled cognitively and physically <laughs> because of the product they're consuming. You know, and, and that is real life context accessibility. Yeah. Well, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oxo grips were predominantly designed for sort of uh, older users or, or disabled users who did not quite have the ability or strength to, to use it. Massive, massive seller and whole, you know, lots of people who it was not specifically designed for used them because they were just a bad product. So that, you know, there's loads of examples of 
just brilliant, you know, where you know, something's been designed to solve a specific problem that is actually useful for many, many people. And, you know, a good few years ago when we saw the phone design, how does a BT design phone that was just a series of big buttons? And that, again, solved massively because it was better than having a phone with like 100 buttons that didn't do anything useful. All you needed was numbers. So they are you know, examples of simplified things. Well, not, not simplified things, designing things better for the, for the, the, the reviews for. I'm a midway UX designer and I feel like I'm a very small fish in a very large pond. So I guess any kind of experience and if you ever felt like a small fish and no one's listening, um, any kind of advice? Because... <laughs> 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 I think just from the experience of like starting here at Code, I think I, it was really interesting. I came from working at a company where they had to build accessible websites basically and then I came to Code and it seemed like no but it didn't seem like we were doing anything for it. Um, until I, I worked really closely with Jim, we did a lot of the talk before, and he is like so passionate about accessibility. And really, like, I think kind of just buddied up with me. It was like, right, okay, let's do this, let's push it. And now, like, we've always got, got the Champions Network going, we found more people who are interested. So it's like, you kind of just have to keep, it, 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 yeah, completely understand it's draining. But keep pushing, like, and maybe try to find someone else as well, like, hopefully, who is, is equally passionate because, like, it will be hard, like, especially if you're the only person who is, yeah, trying to push that. But just keep going, that's the problems. But, like, you're not, you're doing the best thing, like, so, yeah. I think it, it's figuring out in what the <laughs> The answer is yeah, really what, what's the lever that you can pull? So, uh, and the people in battle. So, you know, is there, have you got like a diversity and inclusion champion or a disability champion for staff? Potentially, going to speak to them, or you know, is there someone more senior who's maybe got a, a, a disabled child or something like that? Is, you know, can you get a seat if allies and people fight for it? Um, there's lots of good, if you Google like Purple Parent, uh, one thing or Google. Uh, you know, stats around disabled people try to maybe put together some sort of case to say this is why we need to consider this. It's a moral thing to do, legally you have to, because the Equality Act uh, still applies to, to uh, you lot, which is why Domino, was it Domino's, I think, got sued. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for example, so there are examples out there. Um, what, can you do something small yourself, so could you run an accessibility audit yourself and you know, provide the evidence that actually we're really inaccessible. The risks are, if we get sued, this is what happened to Domino's, um, could you go out and work with a local charity and say, uh, you know, can you, can, you do, can you help me do some testing for me? I'll bring some biscuits or something. Is there something that you could do that I could maybe film a couple of people really struggling to use our service? So, you know, if you're a holiday website and you're inaccessible, quantify how many holidays you are failing to sell because people visit that website and think, is this? I can't. I can't see the images. Uh, I can't read the text. Uh, I can't. You know, I'm trying to find the button to buy the bloody thing, but somebody's carried it as a link, so I can't find it. So I'm going to give up and I'm going to get somewhere else. Uh, it's figuring out what is going to be that cloud, and uh, you know, trying to find a couple of allies and, and being passionate and enjoying talking about it because it, it makes such a huge difference to people's lives. Uh, that that is a you know, various different angles. Um, yeah, I can I can totally relate um, where I uh, currently work. When I first started, I definitely felt like the, the small fish in in um, big ponds. And I think what's what's really helped is um, kind of uh, linking to what Linda said in that you if you can find other people in the business and form some kind of group, it's only going to make your voice that more powerful. Um, I think the biggest challenge that, that uh, we've had is yeah is, is, is trying to get by from the very top. Um, and uh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think trying to build a group of people around you, and I'm not sure if you have things like town halls where you, talk, where you do like wider presentations to the wider business. If you can find that group, talk about it more, um, talk about the reasons why it's important. Other than being it morally right, some businesses only care about the money side of things. So if you can say things like, oh, it will help with your SEO kind of thing, which it does, you know, it, it does link into it. Um, I think yeah, the biggest thing is trying to form that group uh, and as, as we said, just keep talking about it and, and keep going and eventually 
you know, you, you will be, you will break through, it will take time. Emma, your perspective on that's slightly different, just because obviously you go in and help people. Like, how do you essentially do the same thing? Like these guys are kind of working in an industry and trying to find their tribe for it. How do you get introduced in the first place? How does that go? Um, I think for me it's quite a different situation because I work in an environment where everyone is a champion for it. So I haven't personally come across those barriers in my own workplace because one of the things I love about the Deaf Centre is that everybody is so passionate about it. Um, I don't think there's one member of staff who is there because they just see it as a job, like they're there because they care about it. Um, and I'd say kind of half of our staff are hearing and the other half are deaf or everybody um, is able to communicate using sign language and that's kind of one of the one of the deaf centers kind of ethos is that everybody who works there should be able to communicate using that language. Um, that doesn't help much at all. Um, <laughs> I guess I suppose if it comes down to like the company doesn't it and what they stand for and the people that they're employing and what their kind of ethics and and morals and everything is, um, I know that's not helpful at all, um, I but I, I agree, like, find other people who have that same drive and passion to inspire change and try and do something about it. Um, I was just thinking of the aspect of, like, of being a charity or, like, for social enterprises or for anyone who works in the public sector, and I think they can especially relate to what you're saying, because it is so frustrating, and is it is even more frustrating when you have to think about things uh, like funding and the requirements of that funding and the constraints of that funding, and everyone that works in those fields like they do it because they care. You know, it's not because the pay is amazing; it's because you care about people, and it, that just leads you to burnout when you just care so deeply, and. The, you, you can't stop caring because, I don't know, well, I think that's what society kind of wants us to do and to be, you know, little obedient lambs, but there is a lot of, there's a lot of power in caring and there's a lot of, a lot of power in being sensitive. Um, and if you can't find that in your work or if, if you're pouring all that energy into changing things and you can't, and you, you know, of course, you can do all these things, they're going to be helpful, but take it outside of work. What can you do? to use that energy and that passion towards still to improving society, just maybe not towards your job. Like, yeah, our jobs is where we are where we spend most of our time, but they shouldn't be our only source of happiness. And if we do something that we're passionate, let's remind ourselves why we're passionate towards doing that thing, by doing it not in a work context, just because we, we like it. Yeah. So you guys know that when you're doing it well, that we can look to to be able to say to our companies, hey, but look how good they're doing, we could be as good as them. Quite so far, in a way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to say, well, it's not a good point, but I, I really aspire with the, like, with the BBC's website and the Gov website. I know you guys might say different because you experience it right there. But yeah, they, they, they're, they're always the two like, laptop in terms of like, code, especially. They're, yeah, just the best, I think. That's good. Um, yeah, I was going to say AbilityNet does a lot of good work kind of for accessibility. Um, also I would recommend kind of looking at some um, the Digital Poverty Alliance. They just also talk a lot about like digital inclusion and like just access. They just published a new report as well. And then I think there are certain trends that are doing really positive things. I think Apple does a lot of good things for both well obviously. But there's like I think there's specific there's not a brand that does everything perfect for all users. Like that's that's not what inclusion is about. You're, it, it's very hard to get everything right. I would say like a lot of feel like it's impossible, especially what we have available. But for example, I think it was like content that they they have their first ever visually impaired like brand ambassador, uh, and that actually won a uh, Martin Award recently. Their that campaign. But that campaign wasn't just, they got this influencer and she did the advert and that was it. She worked with them from the start. And for example, something else that they put in place because of that is they're introducing um, independent bottles, like this thing that allows people to use Navi Lens, which is like a, 
the technology that they can use to, um, yeah, to like identify the items like on the shelves. And I think that's something really cool and that wouldn't happen if they just got the influencer at the end and say, let's do this commercial. Like even the words that she uses in the commercial, you can tell that that's, that's her own words talking about what it feels like to hear the texture of her hair and touching it. That's not something that a great designer, like a great app, like Mark Thier would have written. Um, yeah, so I think don't look for one place, look for people that are doing good things for a certain access need or for a certain visibility or impairment. Um, I, I, would, I would say to the UK, I, I think it's going to be a bit of going into it. Obviously, the government website is human and it was emerging in about 2,000 websites, so you've still got a lot of crap on there as well. But it's not been transformed, but there are, it's in the service standard, the code is open source, the design system, it's ready to get the design system, it has to be accessible and tested massively. Um, so I think. Government's not perfect, and actually probably the consideration of the stuff around the front end, so actually looking at service as opposed to a product is possibly not the greatest. Um, so government departments probably is still the fear of God into people, so if you look at DWP, people are probably terrified of saying the wrong thing, or a claim form, things like that, so it isn't perfect. But I think it's a decent example of how you know, we should work, so I, you know, I, I would like to get someone say we're doing some accessibility research, which you're not doing accessibility research, you're doing user research, it just so happens you're doing it with a representative sample of people. So if we speak to a teacher who's partially sighted, it's not some special ground of accessibility research, it's just user research with people, still learning about teachers. Um, there is a website uh, that is like an online tool that you, you can subscribe to that will um, it's, it's not site improved, it's not sort site, I can't remember the name of it, but that has a leak table of the most successful websites in a number of different categories. So you can go in and now list shopping websites and there'd be like 50 of them. Well, that, was, that was the web, web aim survey, they did one thing of homepage. It's oh no, homepage. It's, um, it's an actual tool that does accessible tools. I'll, I'll oh, do this. Uh, no, no, I will. I'll do it in a sec. Um, but that has a like <laughs> table of accessible websites through to, so it'll score like 97 yeah. percent through to like 32. Um, and I've used it to go, let's try using a screen reader or using a magnifier with one of these, and it's just awful. Yeah. Um, but it looks great. It's a beautiful looking website, but it, it tests it physically. Um, so yeah, I'll try and dig that out and just share that. Automated tools lie. <laughs> and that's my takeaway from it. They, they, they'll give you a, they're a smack test. Um, and they, 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 they're very useful for giving you a rough idea of, of and, and I think if they're going to be doing all those sites, that's going to be run on an automated tool. I think we worked out, we did some work with the UK, so the original guy, the first accessibility person, actually used to be an accessibility person with the BBC, he's called Al Duggan. Absolutely phenomenal, he was one of the four of us who did the work on the Olympics. An absolutely brilliant person, uh, is now an immense, I think, in, in Bristol. But he, um, we did a piece of work around automated tools, and we roughly worked out out of all the guidelines and guidance there is, within we came, there's like 60 odd different things that you need to test, and within that, there's probably about 100 tests. You're lucky if you can do 10 of those with an automated tool with any degree of accuracy. Um, the rest is just an estimate. So, you know, useful, but not brilliant. Um, if you want really good examples, think about the context of the example you're after. If you want documentation and forms, gov.uk. But you know, BBC's got a login form, a complaints form, you know, booking tickets for shows. Was about it. You know, that, that's not good for forms. And so don't go to the BBC for forms. They don't do forms. Go for pod services, children's games, things like that, where they try and you know do things that they do well. Um, but I will do a bit of plug around this at the minute, it's quite a shameless plug. So I'm part of a group of volunteers who run a network called the Champions of Accessibility Network, and it's a network of people who run the Champions Accessibility Networks. And we've got about 130 organisations now around the world, including Google and Facebook and all sorts of different matters, sorry. And, uh, and um, we haven't got Apple yet, I'm working on it, but you know, the Director of Accessibility. 
But um, we've got pretty much you know, every single Champions Network in the world that we can find from small ones, so there's two or three people in the organization who are trying to start a movement. They're the dancing guy on the hill that no one's dancing with. And you know, through to networks like you know, Intuit that have got like 3,000 people who are in the network. It's enormous. Google's network is massive. Um, so come and find us. You'll find us on LinkedIn, Champions Access Can. Um, it's a closed group, you have to ask to join. We don't allow accessibility agencies in, unfortunately we don't allow anyone that has a lobbying function in, because it's a place where people can share their, their, their worries and fears and it's safe. And, and we just work with our peer groups within that. And we support each other, we meet up every two or three months, we share best practice, we share our you know things that we've learned that don't go well and go well. And we find every organisation is doing it in a slightly different way because their culture is different. There's no one model to this. And it has to fit within the organisational culture. Brilliant. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody on our panel. I've just sat here and all really just listening to you all uh, talk away. So if you give a round of applause to the panel.